Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm your host, David Thompson. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Caroline Janey, who is an associate professor of history at Purdue University and is the author of the most recent work, Remembering the Civil War, Reunion and the Limits of Reconciliation, which is now out with the University of North Carolina Press. So, Dr. Janey, thanks so much for taking some time and joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, if you don't mind, it, this is not your... Uh, standard memory book, I think, particularly for people who've read a lot of memory lately uh, pertaining to the Civil War. So I think if you could just offer us a bit of a broad overview here uh, from the start, that would be great. Sure. Well, my intention with the book, and it was part of the Littlefield series, which is asking us to look broadly at various topics in the Civil War. So I really wanted to take the book um, all the way back, meaning to the beginning of the Civil War, when I think many of the the issues, of course, I, they started in the antebellum period, but the sectional uh, discord began during the war. So I be, began in 1861, and I take it all the way up through Gone with the Wind, through 1939, really looking at 75 years or more of the way that the war generation, and to some extent their children, thought about, understood, remembered, celebrated, mourned, all of those various verbs, the war, uh, looking at both men and women, veterans and non-veterans, black and white. Really, in, in many ways, it is a um, an overview, a synthesis. It certainly has new research in it, but I, I really wanted to paint a broad picture of uh, the trajectory of the Civil War and the way it was remembered by those who experienced it, and at least the generation after. And I think you mentioned that you, you bring this back to at least 1861. And it's worth noting when you look at these first two chapters of this work, it brings us to May of 1865. It effectively brings right. us to the end of the war. Right. Um, you see a lot of memory studies that start, you know, immediately after the war ends and, and move from there. I wonder, you know, what, I suppose, partly why did you pursue that angle of, of going back to 61, and what does going back into the war itself actually tell us about how, you know, one another from North or South viewed the other side during the war and how that maybe perhaps impacted the immediate memory of the war itself. Well, I should tell you that I actually cut out, I had another, I had a third chapter in there that was, you know, that, that 1865 period. I had, in fact, a whole chapter on two weeks after Appomattox. And, and I, obviously I, I did condense some of that. But what I was really drawn to was the fact that there's so much animosity, there's so much of the ground laying for what comes, what most historians have talked about is the 1880s, 1890s when they talk about Civil War memory. But my um, feeling was and still is that we can't really understand why the war generation acted as they did, thought the way they did after the war, unless we really went back and sifted through um, what they were, what they were feeling, their motives during the war, and also, then it, it allows us to unpack and uncover some of those myths that, that become so popular in the 1880s and 1890s. For example, uh, a lot of talking about, you know, um, battlefield um, fraternization during the war, and talks about it Fredericksburg and other places, which is something the veterans like to commemorate, like to, to talk about in the 1880s, 1890s. And if we go back and actually look at what's going on in 1862, 1863, Sure, there's some of that, but we see a much different picture. So, again, looking at some of the myth-making itself, if, if we go back to the war period. And perhaps I, I should have started with this, but if you look at the, the title of your book itself, you know, Reunion and Reconciliation both feature very prominently. And I think uh, the readers uh, who pick this up, and I recommend that they do, will see that you go to great lengths to differentiate between the two, and that it's very important that we do. So I wondered if you might be able to share just a little bit with our viewers here. Um, when we say reunion and reconciliation, these are these are two very different things, and, and why that's actually important. Sure, and, and to be fair, reunion and reconciliation are not only used as synonyms today among historians and, and, and the general public when we talk about the war, but they were sometimes used as synonyms by the war generation. But when I really started looking at how Union veterans in particular were using the words, many of them, not always, but many of them made um, took special care to differentiate between what they meant. Reunion, meaning the literal uh, reunification of the nation. For some, that happened in April of 1865, after Appomattox, after Durham Station. 
For others, they considered reunification to have occurred when Reconstruction was over, so it was late as 1877. So it's, it's the literal reunification of the nation, of the states being back in the Union, regardless of debates about whether or not secession had, had ever happened, the notion of congressional representation, all of those things, that's reunion. For Union soldiers, that's what they've been fighting for, most of them. That's what they've been fighting for all along. Reconciliation, though, is something a little bit different. Reconciliation could be, um, could be a feeling it could be an act, and when I say an act, uh, the veterans are talking about the fact that they have to go and perform this reconciliation. They have to go and do the ritual handshake across the bloody wall for the photographers, for all the, the groups that might be there, for the, the dedication ceremony. Reconciliation was more a matter of the heart, and as such, it's harder to define. There certainly were some veterans who agreed to forgive and forget what happened, but for many of the others, they embraced reunion, the reunification of the nation, but they weren't ready to, to really um, embrace a heartfelt feeling for their former enemies. And that too, um, Confederate veterans too, sometimes struggled with these issues. Yes, they could acknowledge that reunion had happened, but whether or not they loved and were, were willing to you know, wrap their arms around their former enemies was a far different story. And for, for many of us out there, we're very familiar w with another one of your works, obviously, Burying the Dead and Not the Past. And that's looking at uh, certainly Southern, Southern women and their role in this process. Um, mm -hmm. you, obviously, you expand on that, um, moving up, away from the, just the LMAs and looking at Northern and Southern women um, who didn't necessarily – well, I, I guess I shouldn't speak for you. I wondered if, if you could uh, elaborate just a little bit on – how women figured into this um, process, I guess we should say. And, and as you note, my first book is not the only work that looks at Confederate women. There's been an awful lot of work that looks at Confederate women in the post-war period. And there is a little bit of work. There's um, a great book by Nina Silber that looks at the gender conflict of remembering the war. A little bit of work here and there that, that talks about groups like the Women's Relief Corps. But I was really struck that women seem to disappear from the picture if we weren't talking about either the Ladies Memorial Associations in the immediate post-war period or the United Daughters of the Confederacy in the 20th century. And so what I really wanted to do was to incorporate Unionist women, uh, both black and white, um, North and South, because there certainly were Unionist women in the South, into this story. And when I did so, I found that the animosity toward reconciliation was just as visceral among Unionist women as it was among their Confederate counterparts. And I have to admit, I was surprised by that. I, I thought that I would see Unionist women really not caring as much about the war, um, being much more involved in things like the Women's Christian Temperance Union or other women's activities. I was absolutely astonished at the number of women who were involved in Union memorialization efforts, whether it was through the Women's Relief Corps or... Um, the ladies of the GAR, or countless other groups, daughters of, of the Union veterans. And, and again, just to reiterate my point, they are, are um, just as against reconciliation, just as against this kind of handshaking with uh, Southern white women as many of their husbands and brothers and, and uncles and fathers were um, resistant to reconciliation with veterans. I think it's, it's worth, I mean, if not even more so, it, it, it's really striking when, when you get into the book and, and see this, just the reaction that they don't, they don't necessarily have to deal with the photo ops and they're, and they're grateful for that because they don't want to. Right. And on, on one hand, it's a very practical um, notion. I mean, I try, I try to, to explain why this was the case. Why are women less engaged, less likely to, to be part of this reconciliationist gush than their male, male counterparts? I think part of it is they simply don't have that battlefield experience to fall back on. That for, for men, that yes, they can come together and even though they might have, have literally shot toward one another, that they can talk about how awful camp life was and how awful marches were and things of that nature. For the women, even though they might have experienced some of the same things on the home front, they never saw it that way. They never saw their contribution to their respective war efforts as something that, that they shared in common. So there's a lot of animosity 
that continues. But then there's also the notion, especially among Confederate women, that their their men sometimes silently, sometimes very vocally encourage this behavior, encourage them to be outspoken against the Yankees and, and Unionists in general. And there's nothing to lose. They're not representatives in Congress for the most part. We're not talking about business women who need to work together. They're seen as eight political figures, both North and South. And there's no real reason for them to come together in the reconciliationist embrace. And obviously African Americans are, are part of this narrative as well. And I, I wonder if you could touch on that just a little bit, because that in and of itself is also fascinating. Right. And here I'm building on work, um, work by people like Barbara Gannon, who's done so much to to enlighten us to the extent to which African Americans were part of the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, in, in the book, I talk about um, how African American veterans, how USCT veterans in the immediate post-war period, they did have a, a different memory of the war. For them, the war was first and foremost a war about freedom, about ending slavery, where their white counterparts, that wasn't the case. The war was first and foremost for most of them about union. But I also trace um, the interaction of um, black and white members of the GAR throughout the, the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. And I look at things like Emancipation Day celebrations. One of the things that I was really struck by was the effort to create a national Emancipation Day. And the African American community really struggled with this, never really came up um, with a solution. They settled on January 1st, but even that wasn't universally um, uh, honored the way Memorial Day on May 30th was among um, northern states. So there was a, there was a lot of struggle in um, where slavery fit in. Should slavery be part of the story of Civil War veterans? Should it be put aside and not talked about? Uh, to what extent were women involved in were African American women involved in the Women's Relief Corps? And they actually were quite involved well into the 20th century. So we do see these strands of African-American memory that are separate from white memory, from the white union memory, but we also see places where they certainly overlap to a, a significant extent. Now, I mean, this is obviously moving us away, I, I think, from a lot of the recent memory scholarship that has been stressing that reconciliationist narrative. And you very much are stressing this a dynamic, contested, really, memory of the war. Uh, do you think w with the future scholarship, and there will be when it comes to, to memory studies of the war mm -hmm. down, the, down the line here, do you think we're going to see a little bit of a shift? Do you, do you think we are on the cusp here of something? Um, do you hope that we are on the cusp here of something? Uh, how, where, where do you think this, we're going to be going now in, with the future of memory scholarship? Well, I, I think that two things are, are going to happen and are already happening, I should say. My work is, again, building on the work of other scholars. This isn't um, I certainly don't want to take credit for all of this. People like John Neff, whose um, book, Honoring the, the Civil War Dead, I think is a, a fantastic book that looks at the Union side and the ways in which Union veterans remembered the war. Um, again, works by Barbara Gannon, I've already mentioned, work by Gary Gallagher, um, Keith Harris. Other people are already talking about these kind of limits of, rec of the reconciliationist sentiment and the notion that I think we've gotten caught up in the, the Ken Burns image of veterans clasping hands at Gettysburg and this notion that, that reunion and reconciliation triumphed and um, that Union veterans were willing to ignore contentious issues, slavery, most importantly, that, that the memory of the war was whitewashed and in which slavery gets written out while white Union and Confederate veterans come back together clasping hands. I think we're really seeing a shift away from that. And... What we're also going to see at the same time and what we're starting to see are more works that go beyond the 1915 um, time period. For a long time, memory studies focused on the period from about 1880 to 1915. And as we get past that 50th anniversary of the war, there certainly have been more works on the centennial of the war. David Blight's new book, The American Oracle, uh, Robert Cook's new book, well, relatively new book, Troubled Commemorations, um, takes us through the 1960s. And there are some books I know that people are, are working on right now that are coming all the way up to the present, looking at the sesquicentennial. So hopefully what we'll see is more emphasis on this long 
long Civil War memory that whether it picks up just in the 20th century or whether it ties in from, you know, 150 years worth. And I also hope that there will be more work done on unionist women. There, there needs to be a monograph written on the ways in which union women affected and were affected by um, the memory of the war. Seems like there are a lot of avenues for, to pursue there. Absolutely. Uh, now, at Purdue, you are very much in the classroom as well. Um, so I wonder, you know, when you get into the classroom and you have the opportunity to, to teach the Civil War and the Civil War era, I should say, mm-hmm. more broadly, uh, what types of things are you trying to impart on your students uh, about this conflict? Well, one of the things for my students, whether it's my Civil War class or um, other classes I teach, such as women's history, is I really want students to think about people in their own time and context and really trying to to get them to focus in on we don't know what happened next. We don't know, for example, that the Civil War is coming. One of the things I do when I teach the coming of the war, and my lecture title should probably be changed because it's you know, antithetical to what I'm trying to, to teach, is that people didn't wake up each day and think, ah, you know, there's a civil war around the corner. How is the Dred Scott decision going to affect that? How is that going to affect my life? That's not the types of things that they're thinking about on a daily basis. So I really try to, to get down to the nitty gritty. Um, at the same time that I give them the big political and military overview, I want them to grasp what's going on at the ground level. So one of the things that I did um, last year in my Civil War class was the uh, many of the readings were firsthand accounts. So we read a lot of different, we read Louisa May Alcott's hospital sketches, we read uh, Company H, and trying to get the students then to, to put that into a bigger picture of the political um, and military story that's going on. Well, Dr. Janey, I don't want to take up too much of your time today, but uh, simply a remarkable work that I would recommend to everyone. Again, it's Remembering the Civil War, Reunion and the Limits of Reconciliation, out with UNC Press. Uh, Really, anyone who's interested in the war uh, and and its aftermath and and moving into uh, looking at how do people actually remember this conflict and and kind of the generational um, shift over time, looking at those who actually experienced it firsthand and and their descendants. So uh, a really great book, uh, wonderful synthesis, I think, on the topic that everyone should pick up. So Dr. Janey, again, thanks so much for joining us today and hope we can have you back on again soon. Thank you. It's my pleasure.